Grotty Grotto, we are going to banish festive fecklessness and the ghosts of Christmas past and do everything properly. In tonight's bulging sack, we have a blast felling our man lab Christmas tree. In three, two, one, bomb. We make some crackers, crackers. We make Christmas dinner with military precision. It's turkey time! And good King Wenceslas Oz leans out of a window in an attempt to create our own snowstorm. Holy 
expensive, yes, I know, but nevertheless, a superb way to cut down a tree. However you measure it, and including the Richter scale, that was a success. All that remains is for our own East End elf, Rory, to drag it back to the Mad Lab. Here then is our loveliest of trees erected by the magic of Yuletide television in the corner of our man lab. And it's even better than it looks because we've mounted it on this powered rotating plinth that I can operate from this piece of very modern electrical equipment down here. Watch this. Off it goes, allowing us to display all sides of the tree and not just the bit facing the room. And better still, by rotating this knob, I can change the speed so I can make the display more dynamic and this also has the added advantage of getting rid of Rory for us. How about that? Now later on we'll be showing you how to decorate a tree of this size in the modern man lab way but before that we're going to move into the kitchen and interfere with time itself. Follow me. We're going to cook a right corker of a Christmas feast for our special man lab guests. Expecting proper food with no lumps or raw bits are Dr. Ben, who helped me explode a dead budgie a few weeks ago, Matt McIver, the lead singer from Love Fungus, Razor Ruddock, who shouted at me a lot when I missed a penalty, Simmy, and various people from our office who are fed up with the usual crew. Cooking well for a large number of people is difficult, so we've drawn a table and created our own time zone. It's called turkey time, and here it is, and here is zero hour when everything is ready to serve. And from this very, very handy, very clear colour-coded chart, we can work out that, for example, at zero hour turkey time, minus three hours and 30 minutes, somebody must peel the parsnips. At zero hour, minus three hours, 45 minutes, somebody has to read the instructions on the bread sauce packet. It's all perfectly clear. There's absolutely no excuse for making a baubles of this. We'll try that baubles joke again later on because I'm sure it'll work. Meantime, quickly grab a pen and write all this down before we move on to something else. Uh, I'm now going to declare it turkey time minus 5 hours and 30 minutes. In charge of logistics, and not especially imbued with the spirit of goodwill, is Sergeant Major Weston. And on extra duties in the cookhouse is Lance Corporal Oz Clark. Carry on, Sergeant. Clark, put that down. Go over there and tell me about turkey weights and timings. Go, come on, move on. Keep your hair on. God. OK, turkey. Now, the two most important things about turkey are how many people have you got? And a turkey will basically do one kilogram will do about two people. So a six kilogram turkey like this will do 12, 13 people. And secondly, timings. If you put the oven at about 190 degrees centigrade, that's gas mark five, uh, about 20 minutes per kilogram, six of those, therefore, six kilograms, two hours. Plus, you need to add about 90 minutes, that's 90 minutes at the end. So two hours plus 90 minutes, three and a half hours. Three and a half hours, dead simple. Good, now for the stuffing and some advice from the sergeant. Hurry up. Oh, all right then. Time waits for no turkey. Every second counts. This is an electric stove. Right. Most importantly, our Sergeant Major is under strict orders not to let Oz touch a drop until dinner is served. What are you supposed to be doing? Turkey, right. Um, uh... So, leaving Oz to struggle with his cold turkey, we turn to the problem of dressing our tree. It is estimated that every year British men spend 60 million man-hours decorating Christmas trees by hand, and that at any one point in the 48-hour run-up to Christmas Day, at least 30 of them are in casualty with bauble-related injuries sustained falling off a small step ladder. Now we like to pretend that it is a joyous, tinsely communion in the bosom of the family, but it isn't. Let's be honest, it's Dullsville. So, I ask Sim, our Socrates of the socket set, to bring some military thinking to bear on this problem. This is the barrel of a mortar. <laughs> Compressed air mortar fires pretty much anything that will fit inside that tube. The mortar is a weapon that's been around since as early as 1453, and like Jeremy Kyle's gob, nothing good has ever come out of it. Extremely popular in both world wars, its bombs could be aimed to fall directly into trenches. Our 60p 
PSI controlled action bauble water, though, has the rather more jolly task of firing meaningless festive guff at our tree. It's like being the Wright brothers, except we're decorating a tree instead of improving humankind with the invention of powered, controlled, and sustained flights. Simi welds up a few joints, and we fit a valve for the compressed air. Our mortar is now ready to deck the halls at 50 paces, but it still lacks a certain something. Right, the only thing that's really missing from this sim is some sense of it being a proper sort of military weapon. It needs to be camouflaged so that it blends in with its surroundings. That's what you do with the mortar, isn't it? It's, it is indeed. Let's paint it. No one would suspect anything. Okay, inaugural fiery tail bauble. Loaded. Pressurize. Charge. Four bar. Fire at will. <laughs> right, more. For those of you who haven't served in the Christmas military, fire! The mortar works very simply. A remote compressor feeds air to a reservoir in the mortar, which is controlled by a valve. Lovely. <laughs> when the valve is released, whatever symbol of goodwill is in the tube is fired out. It is the pipe of peace. <laughs> <laughs> Look at that. Sorry, can we just... I just want to point this out before the tree gets away. No stepladder, no effort. Admittedly, one of the baubles has shattered, but you don't see that from this side, so that's okay. But then, a snag. That's a bit rubbish. Yeah. How are we going to do tinsel? Because it does need proper tinsel for that tree to look suitably cheesy and Christmassy. Sim had an idea, and we'll now shout it at you. This is a four-stroke petrol, normally aspirated leaf blower. Air-cooled, it's given me an idea. Now that we have a fair smattering of traditional baubles on the tree, Millie and I are going to add these symbolic tool decorations, partly because they embody the spirit of man. But more importantly, let us not forget that the Christ child himself would have been familiar with tools such as these in the workshop of Joseph the Poor. leaves around is pointless, so Simi has converted the irritating contraption into a breech-loaded tinsel machine gun. Say hello to my little festive friend. Brick to 
one edge, two, three, four, plus an extra one to allow for the overlap. Then you can cut your paper. Then you simply fold the paper over the gift item, stick it down, and then you form the ends into triangles. It really is fantastically easy. However, it's never actually like that, is it? Because you end up on Christmas Eve with 20 oddly shaped gifts that you've bought as distressed purchases from your local petrol station, rolling around in a drunken stupor with bits of sticky tape stuck all over your face and missing the guns of Navarone. There is, however, an easier way to do all this. This is a vacuum packing bag. It's used by people to store uh, pillows, spare duvets and other things that really ought to go to the dump. We have taken some and we have coloured them red and indeed Green. It is now a simple matter of opening up the bag, putting in the gift item, like so, sealing the bag along this special pressed together edge, like so. Now, you take any domestic vacuum cleaner, this is what one looks like, you unscrew this cap, like that, you apply the nozzle to that, turn on, freed up enough time to watch the guns of Navarone and probably bridge over the River Kwai as well. What could be simpler? Ooh, I wonder what it could be. Meanwhile, as Oz is still prepping the potatoes and feeling like he's in mash... Faster! Get a move on! Let me tell you about a grand undertaking which we'd begun a little earlier. We'd already checked off the top answer on our Man Lab Christmas survey by getting a tree. While that was making its way to the lab, we set about dealing with the second highest answer. It was much more tricky. Here is the Christmas card that Richard Hammond sent me last year. In fact, I've been getting cards something like this for most of my 48 years, and it shows, in direct contravention of my lifetime's experience, some snow. Now, I have never actually seen it snow on Christmas Day. I've never even heard it forecast for Christmas Day, which gives the Met Office, in fact, a 100% reliability record. And the thing is, we are British. We love talking about the weather. And we can print as many cards like this as we want. But the fact remains, we can't do anything about the weather. We cannot actually make it snow. Or can we? You see, it's been done before. On the 13th of November 1946, Science's Vincent Schaefer and Bernard Vonnegut performed the first attempt at cloud seeding during a flight over New York. By dumping six pounds of dry ice into a target cloud, the two boffins discovered that tiny liquid droplets in the cloud could be instantly transformed by this super chilled shock into ice crystals. The minute ice crystals then collide and grow into snowflakes until, finally, it snows. Bernard Vonnegut, incidentally, was the brother of novelist Kurt Vonnegut. My brother was unavailable, so I've teamed up with Oz Clark. Don't worry, the flasks contain dry ice. My name's Oz. Hello, Oz. How are you, mate? I'm Max. I'm the pilot. <laughs> I'm about to hit it. <laughs> right, Oz, scramble. <laughs> This doesn't bode well. He has to open the window a bit later on. I'm now beginning to worry about what scientists call the Oz uncertainty principle, in which the inclusion of an Oz in an experiment or undertaking has a detrimental effect on the results, rendering them meaningless or even hazardous. sounds like Oz coming now and the conditions are actually almost perfect. The thing to remember is you can't do cloud seeding if you have no clouds at all. It's why it isn't an answer to the world's drought problems. You can't make a cloud in perfectly blue sky by this method. What you need is a cloud with some water already in it and then you encourage it to become rain or in our case snow. And we have very good clouds high up 
the, the paler clouds are stratocumulus, not particularly good for rain, but underneath those, nimbostratus, these ones, uniformly dark grey, falling rain or snow. That is exactly what we want. They're ready to produce water, and if it's frozen, of course, snow. We just need to make it do it here, rather than wherever it was intending to do it. Probably somewhere over there. Right, they're just below us. I, I can see them all. I don't know see what they're doing. James is red sweater. Yeah, I can see him looking like the Queen of Norway. We are remaining very, very true and faithful to the original Schaefer and Vonnegut experiment here. We've got the same amount of dry ice at the same temperature, minus 78 or thereabouts. We're also throwing out some table salt because the very tiny particles will form the nuclei of the cloud. They are the little droplets, normally dust or even bacteria in the atmosphere, around which the cloud droplets form. And then they eventually turn into rain or, if it's cold enough, snow. in his pilot climbing quite hard now. We've just climbed through Nimbostratus, which is exactly the sort of thing we're after. Oh, no, that one is any good. Yeah, yeah, that's perfect. Absolutely wonderful. <laughs> such a good idea. Now, Max, I've got one secret weapon with us. OK, which, which is a bottle of Kentish brewed beer, a local oh, beer. Oh, God. And it seems to me that if all this nonsense about the dry ice and the salt and all that rubbish, what you need is some good hops and good Kent barley going straight through the cloud. I don't think the, uh, I don't think the alcohol idea will work. I was to be a cold shot, not to get it clattered. OK, here we go. Sierra Alpha, see you later. Let's not forget that in the original experiment it didn't snow immediately, it snowed a bit later. So let's just hang on. It, there's rain, I've got rain on my face, there's no denying that since Oz turned up it has started raining a little bit. 
There's a bit more. And more. It's raining. It's raining, isn't it? It is raining. Look at this. This is not TV trickery. There isn't somebody standing over there with one of those things that you use when you're ironing. That is rain. And that was just the start. I mean, I know Bing Crosby never dreamed of a wet Christmas, but it's halfway there. Look at it. I mean, it may have been about to rain anyway, but I don't think it was. Look at that, he's chucking it down. I mean, it's not snow, but it's not cold. If it was cold, that would be snow. Oz, you've done it. Fantastic! It is a miracle. That is incredible. From the stuff you use for a Genesis concert, we've changed the weather. Giving up with snow either. We'll try with snow again in the man lab, but for now, look at me. Oz Clark did this. <laughs> okay, it wasn't the blizzard of Oz that we've been hoping for. It might have been too warm for snow, and it might have shrunk my favourite Christmas jumper. But for one glorious moment, co pilot Oz, I can't get in or out of an aeroplane, Clark delivered the goods. The question remained, though, could we ever really make it snow? Back at the kitchen, and our man lab pacemaker experts have informed us that Oz can't be subjected to the sergeant major any further. So I've stepped in. Oz? Yeah? I think the, the thing is... Is this, is this the neck end? Yeah, but because it's been degutted, it's sort of, it's like a tube, you can shove it in either end. The next thing is to work out how we actually cook it and keep it moist. Now, I'm a bit of an old-fashioned put bacon over the top chap. What about you? Yes, I am. But okay. I think for people who've not done it before, there, is, there are two methods of doing this. One is to just turn the bird upside down and roast it in the tray and then turn it over later and put the bacon on. But for safety, you do it in the wrapped in foil method. Unfortunately, I sent one of our... <laughs> I know. If, when you go to buy the foil for roasting your turkey, especially if you're doing a big one for lots of people, you get the extra wise turkey roasting foil, not this sprout roasting foil that one of our feeble minded and callow uses for. But it doesn't matter, we can I've still never make seen it work. small foil in my life. Wrapping the turkey in foil means that the juices will stay in the meat, and cooking it upside down means that they will concentrate in the breast. Okay, turkey in on its back. Upside down. Upside down. You realize this is breast incredibly poncy chef way of doing it. And I would have thought you of all people would not want to do it this way. This is why there was a sergeant major in the original plot. Our turkey is now going in 27 minutes and 8 seconds too late. Our guests are on their way, and I still need to organize the festive entertainment. There are many sad side effects to Christmas. Unwanted gifts, thick head, broken telly, remembering that your family is absolutely awful, and of course, getting fat. But not in Man Lab, because here is the Man Lab Exercise Centre, which some of you will recognise as the Swiss Army Bicycle from earlier in the series. Now, what is the point of an exercise bicycle? Where is the incentive to pedal? Well, we have one, because, tragically, the transformer in our record player has broken down, and now the bicycle powers the music, so if you stop pedalling, everybody will hate you. Since we already resent him for his youth and wit, I put Rory on the bike. Wait for it. Too fast. A bit faster. That's it. That's it. Rory, the red-faced peddler, was doing a great job, but I needed something grander for my guests' amusement. Something deeper, crisper, and certainly more even. Right, let's return to our attempts to make it snow. Earlier on, Oz threw some CO2 out of the window of a small aeroplane onto a cloud, and we were very surprised when this didn't work, but the fact is that it didn't. A sensible man might accept defeat at this point, 
But sod it, it's Christmas, so filled with a festive kamikaze recklessness, we're going to make the job even harder by trying to make it snow indoors, right over our unsuspecting guests. What may help us in our quest is a fluke discovery made by our favourite cloud seeding pioneer, Vincent Shaper. He discovered that if he breathed into a freezer containing super cold dry ice, the vapour would be instantly shocked into becoming millions of microscopic ice crystals. It seemed like a good starting point. This is a humidifier. It is a device that produces, you'll see this as Sin plugs it in, a little stream of water vapour. That is vapour, it's not steam from a kettle. We're going to put this in the freezer which is running at a temperature of what, minus 12? More like minus 18. Minus 18. There's the humidifier running. You can just see the beginnings of our cloud forming. And of course, a lot of people, old people especially, will look at the sky and go, eee, it's too cold to snow. But that is not true. If anybody says that to you, you can punch them in the face. The Met Office says it's not true. And in any case, I've been to the North Pole where it's chuffing cold and there was snow all over the place. The fact is, freezes at naught in clouds because there is energy in the vapour. It sometimes needs a temperature as low as minus 40 to remove all that energy and form the ice crystals. So it's not too cold to snow in our freezer. If anything, it may not be cold enough, but let's see. Inside the polystyrene box is a block of solid CO2, carbon dioxide, or dry ice as it's commonly known, with which you will be very familiar if you've ever been to see Genesis or Pink Floyd. Uh, it's called dry ice because it can perform the remarkable trick of jumping straight to a solid, to a gas, without going through the liquid stage. It's at minus 78 degrees naturally. This will shock our cloud and hopefully make instant crystals form, which would then turn into snowflakes. Go! Look at that! <laughs> it's not a cloud! <laughs> When it comes to making snowflakes, naturally occurring clouds have two big advantages over our freezer-based version. As even a drunken buffoon in a Gillingham skull would have noted, real clouds are A, huge, and B, they're blown around the sky. To help our snowflakes form, we need to make our captive cloud more windswept. So we're going to try and effectively increase the distance that they move inside here with this small fan, which will create very turbulent conditions inside the freezer compartment. That's brilliant. Look at our cloud. Look at our cloud. As the temperature plunges past minus 40, our cloud makes it difficult to see what's going on. But then, like a small boy looking out of the window on Christmas morning, Sin makes an exciting discovery. I can see Snow. Look. He's right. Look at this. Look at this. There's snow on the fan. You see that snow? The fan has now frozen up and stopped, although we do have in front of it a small patch of what might be considered snow, but that we suspect is actually frost. I'll just show you the fan. Is it snow? Yeah, I think that's sort of snow. It's certainly white, fluffy and cold, but does it pass the internationally recognised standard test? I'll throw it at Sim and see, does this feel like a snowball? No. <laughs> Ball, so. so we do have to think about this a bit harder, but that is, that's, that's a beginning. It's cold and it's white and it's on the floor. The results are inconclusive, and considering we've only made enough for a scale model of Richard Hammond, we're going to have to improve our methods of production if we're to astound our dinner guests with a real indoor snowfall. Well, there you go. Doesn't turkey time fly when you're having fun with popular science? Yeah. I'm off back to the kitchen. Now the carrot, and I suspect an argument. In fact, I'm so confident of this being an argument that I have added the argument to our scheme here in turkey time. We've got 15 minutes for it. Anyway, peeling a carrot, rather like the parsnip, I find it works better if you just wet it slightly. And then the blade... You don't have to peel it. Well, yes, you do. You honestly don't. That's not modern carrots. You have. do not have to peel You just rub them. Modern carrots. As a modern carrot. It's, it's a carrot. There is a school of thought that says, I'll divide this in half and show you what I mean, that you should cut them into what people like to call baton, 
i.e. lengthways like that. That is considered the posh way to cut a carrot. But after many years of experimentation, I have decided that the school dinner lady way, which is to cut them into circles, like so, actually makes for a better tasting carrot. And the only reason I can think, wait for it, the only reason I can think of for that is that if you cut them into a circle, you get a better ratio of surface area to volume, so they cook quickly, which is nice if you like rather undercooked vegetables as I do, which, yeah. you don't <laughs> wait, I which you don't necessarily get if you cut them up into battens like that. Yes, I know it's considered posh and it makes you a member of the middle classes, but what are we interested in? Outmoded Victorian conventions or carrots that taste nice? Go. You're absolutely full of it, James. It's nothing to do with middle class uh, things. It's yes, nothing it to do with calling it a baton. The carrot's flavour changes like that, not across. There, you've got a much different flavour from there. That's a more intense flavour there. That's a sweeter flavour there. If you do it lengthways like that, through one enjoyable moment of of chopping your carrot up on the on the plate, you get two or three different flavours. Not your way. Also, I no, think no, no, that's that, a, that basically... You, 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 I'm going to have to disagree with, with you there, because no, you can't put all Meanwhile, our guests have arrived, oh, and they're so bored. So Well, then the sugars will caramelise at the temperature of steam, which is how we're going to cook. All right, then. Hey, right. you two fez, stop arguing. Just chop the bleeding things up, all right? Then just hack them up. You haven't got a preference? No. Yeah, look, yeah. I'll show you what the preference is, boy. Out of the way, look, simple. You wasted all that time, all right? But you've done both. Don't make no, never mind, do it. What the hell's that? Hey, that's really ugly. It's going to go down your gilbert, isn't it? Hey? While Stoz and I try to work out what your gilbert is and why you want to stuff carrots into it, our guests are still far from merry. Oz, though, has come up with a solution that also gets around the rule that says he can't touch a drop until dinner. Right, this is good. This is a new invention, and it gives you all the pleasure of drinking without the irritating business of having to drink. And it's called the Whiskey Cloud of Peace. Now, although this might get you round the Sergeant Major, please bear in mind that this idea has come from a man dressed like a smurf. You've got a plastic bottle like this, and you've got a bottle of whiskey. You put a tiny bit of whiskey in it. I mean, really half a tot. That's probably too much, in fact. Well, not too much. OK, now, shove that in here. Got that in there, like that. And now you've got the foot pump. Let's go. I feel a bit bad. The constant bullying by the Sergeant Major has clearly destroyed Oz's mind. See at the top is holding this in. Look what happens now. drop in pressure makes a bit of the whiskey evaporate effectively, it boils. Yeah. Wash it, take it. Read it, read it. Take Dom Merrily on hand. What do you feel like? Mmm, that's good. It's not bad, is it? But what would the guests think? Oh, are we ready? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Um, 
most of the best things are not. Before we start the attempt, it's worth seeing just how cold liquid nitrogen is. I've put these gloves on because it is obviously minus 200 and it would hurt if you got even a splash of it on your fingers. Should we uh, have a look and see what temperature it's at? Yeah. yeah. This? Flour in.
bullet. I know why it's called a bullet hit. I think it's because in war films they put these other people's clothing and it explodes with a little blood yeah, hey, in regular like, yeah, yeah, it's like uh, Essentially, it's a squib. A squib. That's yeah, it. that's the other uh, alternative name for it. I don't actually want to blow the guess up. I will. I'm quite happy to <laughs> this, be, this is it. Give yeah. them a mild shock. So that's a pull switch. When you pull that out, yeah, it, it completes the circuit with that battery there. Yes. And these wires trigger the charge. Yes. And you've not tested it yet. Let's try it. Martin, would you arm? Uh, um... So if you two pull it and I stand here, I'll be okay. I will stand a few steps back. Okay. <laughs> so you've got the switch in? Yep. Okay. Okay. There you go. That's pretty cool. Now that our guests' ears are leaking blood, we'll give them a really nice hat to wear. Each of our guests will receive in their cracker instructions for how to make a hat. And then, from a pile of paper, they'll be able to produce something like, for example, this Samurai Warriors hat. And I have to say, it's better, isn't it? We decide to improve the traditionally awful Christmas cracker jokes by getting rid of them altogether. This left us free to apply all our creativity to the most disappointing bit of a cracker, the gift. Rather than spread universal gift only with our crackers, we've decided to add an element of jeopardy. We've invented something called cracker roulette. All of our crackers look exactly the same, and each of our ten guests will have to select one at random. But here's the thing. One of them will contain this. It's £500 in tightly bundled, crisp, used notes. But other crackers may contain something not quite as desirable. Oz, the train. The 748 from a dark corner of the Man Lab imagination races to the table. Who's first? It's Rebecca. When you have dared to take a cracker, step over here to the window to put on the glove. Holding your cracker, offer it to the hand. It will pull the cracker with you. Your mystery surprise will fall out here for us all to see and laugh at.
ending. But hang on, but that's a week of work at about five thousand pounds worth of liquid nitrogen. What well, we've got the equivalent of a Chinese takeaway. <laughs> Thank you. 